So well, I'm actually going to uh, try to keep this talk as, as light as possible, but at the same time educational and entertaining, because it's late in the day. And uh, you know, so I know there's a lot of information to process and, uh, that we've got through through the course of the last two days, so the, you know, yesterday and today. So I'm going to start with my introduction, and then we'll get into the talk itself towards the end, have a few, um, few, a few minutes for questions and answers. And then you, know, you can ask me a question. If I know the answer, I'll tell you the answer. Otherwise, I'll make one up. So. Right. <laughs> so my name is Manuranjan Paul, not to be confused with Maruana Paul. All right. <laughs> Manuranjan stands for entertainment, and entertainment, uh, you know, with education is enlightenment. But entertainment without education is actually just a joking thing. So it's a joker. So I went and looked up thesaurus, and in thesaurus I found out that a joker is somebody who's called a banana. Um, you know, if I can use my pointer. They call it banana, and then I was actually going through, and I was like, second banana and a top banana, and like, <laughs> what's this deal, right? <laughs> uh, one of the things that actually was an alternate word for the word joker was the word the, the was the word uh, wise cracker. Now, wise and cracker distinctly and separately are good things to do, right? And I did, I, did I just say cracking is a good thing to do, right? <laughs> but being a wise cracker is not. I like to be wise, all right. Sometimes I have to do this. I have to do cracking. So you take like John, and you know John the Ripper, and you've got to crack some stuff. And we have the like, password crackers. I j actually just saw Manji. Where is, where's Rick? Oh, there he is, He's hiding in the back. He's one of the best password crackers. And so if you want to get your passwords cracked, go to Rick. All right. <laughs> um, I certainly want to be wise. Uh, the scripture actually says that he that winneth souls is wise. And so I am unashamed to call myself a Christian. Some of you think, some of you may think that it is lead. Others may actually think it is lame. After two near-death calls, it actually doesn't matter what you think. All right, I am a Christian, uh, so we. we <laughs> I did have two near-death calls, and you know, I also had another one. I think maybe I should add my third death call. And uh, at that point, my wife basically said, "If you die, die gracefully. Right? Don't do this drama that you're going to die. All right? So <laughs> I kid you not. You can talk to my wife about it. She's like." You know, it's like, if I'm going to drown, then drown so that people admire your drowning. <laughs> so so, so as, uh, as, as part of my calling on earth at this point, and with you folks like Austin and others, who are good, very good, good friends of mine, uh, we founded Hack Formers here in Austin, which, uh, you know, in Austin, uh, which actually has got the mission of teach security, teach Christ, teach security in Christ. And so you guys can follow us on Twitter, or you can, you know, come for our events, participate and plug in with us. We also write, uh, sorry? Who would Jesus hack? What would Jesus hack? <laughs> Every one of us. That was actually the title of my talk that I submitted to DerbyCon. And what would Jesus hack? And uh, they rejected it. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> you know? And Dave Relic is a good friend of mine as well. You know, the guy who wrote Metasploit, uh, the penetration testing guide. He, I met with him this morning, and he's like, I will send you the reasons why they rejected it. And he's going to be diplomatic about it. I know that. <laughs> but I will tell you the truth. <laughs> I also write in my faith blog every evening, and it's uh, called Hidden Treasures. That's what is so deep that you have to dive deep. So, you know, it's got a Facebook site, so you can follow, follow, up, me, follow up with me on my faith site uh, in that. I'm an author, uh, which is evident from these books that I've written. I'm told that there's going to be a book signing after, so I'll meet with Karthik at the back over there. Karthik, wave your hand. Right? So if you're interested, and I will sign it for you. So I'll sign someone else's signature. <laughs> <Right? laughs> so I've got the seven qualities of finding secure software, which is what we'll essentially talk about today. I'm an advisor uh, for software assurance for this organization, which many of you may recognize. Um, I've been appointed by them to have kind of help the organization with their education, um, the training, and, and the certification, specifically around the software security lifecycle uh, certification. So I've got, you know, they give these certifications out and some of you are certified, some of you are aspiring to be, so all the very best if you are to be certified. Um, so I've got personally GISSP and then CSSLP, I'm actually certified number two. Uh, they gave it to a friend of mine who works for Microsoft, Jim Molini, that's number one, I, I think because he worked for Microsoft, he got number one, otherwise it should have been me. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been plugged in the, into the process for a while and so I've got a few more. So. Yeah. Uh, for my day job, I actually do secure solutions. As I founded this company with just training, consulting, and products. And I also have another wing of the organization itself that does certification practice tests for any of these other certifications. So you know, um, you can look into our websites for that. But to backtrack a little bit before I came into the world of security, 
I used to work for them. Oh, I mean them. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. That's why it should have been removed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> when I was doing this, I was actually trying to prevent these guys from doing this. Uh, SQL injection. Um, you know, it's an interesting drop table. You know. <laughs> On a, on a car thing. I wonder if that works on toll roads over here, right? <laughs> to game the system. Um, Cross-site scripting attacks. CSR app, which kind of looks very techy, but it looks better on a t-shirt is what I think. So, all right? so, so I'm trying to keep the hackers from doing these things to our applications. Uh, but even before Dell, my time at Dell as a security, as uh, the AppSec program guy, uh, I used to work in the Bimini Islands in the Bahamas. Uh, and my research was on shark biology, on research, uh, researching the DNA and the uh, their homing behavior um, of lemon sharks. I used to work for this guy who some of you may recognize if you see Discovery Channel Shark Week. Uh, he's uh, Dr. Samuel Gruber, who is uh, the founder of the MS American Ellis Moran Society. So um, you know that I'm kind of a shark junkie, and you know I like sharks, and that's evident from my iPhone apps, which is all about sharks. All right? so, and actually, my, my OWASP uh, badge says Mono the Shark Fall. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Right? Um, and so my friends actually call me the shark. I also do this. Uh, some of you may recognize this uh, uh, if you are into any form of martial arts, which this is actually the, the, the five forms of the, of the animal forms uh, in the Shaolin Kung Fu thing, uh, school. And I am twice removed. So my master, my shifu, is the direct student of um, uh, Grandmaster Sin Kwan Pei, who brought Shaolin Kung Fu to the United States. So, uh, he's kind of the legend, and this is Grandmaster Sin Kwan Pei actually signed my gi, so I take great pride in being like a student of his. But I actually take greater pride because my son, who is six years old, is actually uh, also with me, and so we have this father-son bonding thing. Uh, more importantly, um, with, uh, with him, he and I are both second degree brown belts, which means we're just about a year away from our black belts. So, you know, you guys can clap for that. <laughs> uh, I will tell you this, if you actually, sh if you Google or Bing search Ma Mano Paul Shaolin, uh, there's a video that you will hit which was about how I got disqualified in a tournament for kicking a guy twice in his face, or actually kicking two guys in their faces twice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do security because of my beautiful wife, who is the person behind me doing what I do, and then I've got also a seven-month-old son, and he will be the youngest in Shaolin Kung Fu if he ends up doing this. <laughs> right? He'll outbeat my son, <laughs> you know, my first one. So, uh, so my, my son once asked me, Dada, are you famous? And before I could answer the question, my wife actually responded to him and said, it's what you leave behind in people that matters. It's not the laurels that you have done. That's short-lived. That really matters. So all the books and all that stuff that is really written, it's really not. It's, it's in, 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 inconsequential unless you leave some, you know, something in someone. But am I famous? I had to answer this question. So I said, yeah, I was on Fox News over here at the, at the, at the you know, and this was on the good side. I was on Fox News for the right reasons. So I was talking about, I was talking, it was about Afro the, Sp <laughs> Afro the Stratford hack uh, on WikiLeaks. They interviewed me to see what was the, the root cause. And so it was in Austin, it was in Stratford, it was over here. You know, they called me for that. But I also am famous from this, um, all right. <laughs> This actually, if you Google search Monopole, sometimes you come up with this whole Playboy thing, and that's because the way they indexed it is Keith Mono and Paul, you know, Erdman. <laughs> you know, you know, so this is not me, all right? So, ladies. <laughs> so who am I? I'm actually a Christian author, biologist, CEO of the company, you know, my company, the Sharp, uh, and A, B, C, D, and that's not American born, confused, Desi, all right? So. <laughs> Uh, I love my savior, I love my, I love my spouse, I love my sons, I love Shaolin, I love sh sharks, and I love security. So I am one of the shark Paul, all right? And we're here actually to talk about uh, the seven qualities of highly secure software, which is what you actually came to hear me say. But I'm going to make a few disclaimers. This is not a print my book talk, all right? Uh, I was on a flight once actually reading my book and coming up with a presentation when the guy was sitting next to me. <laughs> The guy sitting next to me here is like, what's that book about? And I go, software security. But what really caught me was the next question he asked, isn't any good. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you answer the question? Is your child ugly or, <laughs> or, or beautiful, right? You gotta, so so I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself and I go, yeah, the author could have done a better job. <laughs> so now it's, you know, 
Uh, it's all opinions expressed over here are my own, not reflective. Oh, wait a minute, that's me, right? So I, I work for myself. So if you are tweeting, um, you know, Facebooking, Facebooking, blogging, you have my permission to do so, as long as you say something nice about this talk. <laughs> so what we produce, we produce highly insecure software. Um, and that's kind of given with the evidence that we see in the industry. And what we really need is highly secure software. So what constitutes a highly secure software is what this talk is about. This talk is also not about the seven things that I need to go put into my code, right? We'll cover components of that in today's talk. For more information, there are publications and the book and other things will help you. But it's not really about just saying, give me a checklist of the things that I need to go put into my code so that my code will now become highly secure software. It's going to take a look at a holistic angle of designing, developing, and deploying highly secure software. And what that constitutes, what we'll see. It takes kind of an operations, a technical, and a management viewpoint <coughs> to the overall, uh, the overall premise of what we need to do to build highly secure software. So before I even get started, what are some of the myths that we need to bust, right? And I was contemplating whether I need to even talk about this. And I asked a friend of mine saying, hey, do you think this should be in this talk? And he said, you know what? The industry is still so immature now that there is, these things are still prevalent in large and small corporations, where there's this whole attitude that we have a firewall, right? Does you nothing if you have just a perimeter and no hardened internal applications, as long as, you know. Um, and, and, and in some cases, you actually don't even have a perimeter, like in the cloud computing space. We have SSL, right? So it trans uh, information on the wire is getting protected. But when it gets stored, how is it actually being stored? And what about data, direct database attacks? So we have these myths that we need to bust. We have an IDS or an IPS. Who's actually looking at the logs of the IDS and IPS? How much of the volume of data that's coming in that's actually making tangible sense so that you can go implement good software security, right? So all these are questions that come back and, they, and when we try to implement security within organizations, there are pushbacks and there are right reasons for those. But we need to be able to get past that and say these are really not true security. We're not accessible from the internet, right? It's another classic one. This is kind of the premise under which the whole SCADA system from the ICS, the industrial control systems, were initially you know, thought of until somebody got an IP point and then now you're in national threat of that being broken into, right? So that again is a myth. This big one is like we've never been compromised, right? But look at the others who've been compromised who are in your same space and who do you think is gonna be the next target? So, you know, so it's become, in fact, we're starting to see that the attacks are moving away from just the corporations like from military to the deacons, from, the, from there to the corporations, to now like social media and social network sites, to, to educational in institutions that hold a lot, of, a lot of data, personal data. So just because you've not been compromised is not you know, gonna help. Security is not my job, right? Another big thing which is like, it's somebody else's responsibility. In fact, there are published reports today which talks about when you go and look at the whole cloud computing space, the service provider is actually saying that it is your responsibility and the consumer or the client or the tenant is actually expecting it, it to be provided as a service from the, con, you know, from the service provider itself, in which case they're just by passing the buck one to the other. And so the not my job responsibility is an important myth that we need to bust. And finally, security adds little or no business value, right? And unfortunately, what happens is the whole concept of value is determined by return on investments, right? So ROI stands for? All right, so from here after, you guys have to take two acronyms from my talk, all right? So ROI stands for risk of incarceration, <laughs> all right? <laughs> the second acronym is CYA, right? Why do, you do, why do you do software security? CYA, and CYA stands for cover your applications, <laughs> all right? So, so what, is, what is highly secure software, right? It's kind of hacker-proof software. I actually put that in there not to invite hackers, but to say that we are getting better and we, we have to get better in the way that we make it harder for the hackers to be able to exploit our software. So will we ever get to the point of being completely hacker-proof? Right, so that was a question. In case I pause after some time, <laughs> you, that would then require a response, which is, an, which is called an answer, all right? So just so let's get the question 101 out. <laughs> So no, it will never be because there's always going to be some residual risk. But we can at least make it to the point where, you know, let's make this as difficult as possible for the hackers. But some of the traits that you actually talk about highly secure software are the ones that actually can demonstrate these qualities of trust or software assurance where it's first and foremost reliable, functioning as the business expects it to, so it's doing what it's expected of. And secondly, it's resilient, so when it is attacked or under attack, it has the ability to withstand and still be reliable in its operation. 
Having said that, though, we, you and I have just rec recognized and agreed that it, since in some situations the, hacker, the, the software is not going to be as resilient as it needs to be, in which case it needs to be reliable, re recoverable, which means when it is attacked and it has been uh, exploited, can it restore itself back to the normal operations? And what are some of the qualities that make it come back to the normal operations? So these, this is how I would define highly secure software. Right? Now, the 007 right, of sec the seven qualities, and we'll go through each one of these in more detail from security being built in to security actually being adaptable. The software itself is adaptable. So security is built in. How many of you have heard about the ESOC's fable about the ant and the grasshopper? Or the ant, you know, was working during summer and working really hard for winter and storing up food, whereas the grasshopper was just playing around. And then eventually, when it was time for uh, uh, winter, when it rolled by, the grasshopper then realized that it had to have been proactive in storing up food during uh, the summer so that it could survive the winter. Now, so when we talk about security being built in, it's about being proactive and not just reactive to the, 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 the times or the attacks that we're seeing. Unfortunately, what has happened is in the industry today, most security professionals, including like the top level managements, have taken a very tool-centric approach of deploying tools to address the security problem, rather than thinking of it, and it's very tactical instead of thinking of it from a strategic standpoint. Right? So in the long run, about five years from now, if I'm going to build some software, is it going to be resilient to the attack that we are going to expect? So if you're going to actually be, if you're tasked with building software today, some of the things you should be looking at is not just the web application attacks that are in place, right? if it's a web application, but also the mobile space. Right? If I'm going to have a mobile offering, then what am I going to have to do with that? If it's going to get deployed in the cloud, what am I going to do with that? And what are some of those other aspects of being strategic in nature to position the business and the value that the software is going to provide for that business in a long-term perspective, because a tool with a fool, a uh, fool with a tool is still a. That was again a question. A fool with a tool is still a fool, right? So, and in many cases, we run these tools, and we don't actually have to even process the results of those tools, and we just live in this world of what, what I call placebo security, right? So, so, what does it take actually in terms of then integrating this whole thing into the life cycle itself? So, it should be a process-centric approach. It should be something that we take in right from the time where we begin with training. It's getting the education of the users appropriate, uh, appropriately completed so that they know what to do with attacks, right? And they know what to do with how to respond to attacks. They know what to do to be able to test and attest the, the, the controls that are in place. Starting with the requirements. Looking at quality requirements and security requirements besides just the functional requirements that are to be in place. And we'll talk about a few sources of those requirements as well. In the design phase, to do, it's a must-have that you do. If you were to pick one thing that you could do from a security standpoint, do a threat model of your application. It's to see what your entry points, what your exit points are, how your data flow is, what are some of the privileged code sections, right? All that becomes so crucial because there are different threat vectors and different threat uh, attackers or misactors and hackers that can try to compromise your application using different things for different reasons. And we'll also see a few of the motivations. Doing an architecture review and the whole attack surface uh, Evaluation. If there was one thing you needed to do in terms of the coding and writing secure code part of it, then it's about making sure that you look at at least some of the top 10 attacks and putting the control access, control points to secure coding itself. A static analysis would be another thing that you may want to look at doing static analysis of your code itself once it's been generated. Uh, in the testing space, dynamic analysis and then doing security validation, right? So from an assurance standpoint, making sure that you have you can certify that the software is truly secure from a technical standpoint and from a management standpoint, looking at the risk itself so you can accredit the risk to saying it's something within my acceptable threshold or not. Uh, when we get to release, you know, looking at secure installation, it doesn't actually do us any good if our developers and all our uh, you know, testers have gone through this entire life cycle and they've built really highly secure, resilient code, and the guy who's going to deploy puts it up and to run with administrative privileges, right? <laughs> And so it, you kind of nullified everything that you've done in the previous life. So it's secure installation to continuous monitoring from patch management to you know, configuration management that needs to be in place. Um, and finally, we also need to not forget that software is written, it's to run, but at one point it has to also retire, right? So, and so from the standpoint of having to rotate an archive, if it's like crypto keys or something like that, or the data and the media itself needs to be sanitized or removed so that you securely dispose of that. So and with, that's kind of one of the things that we try to run an old horse and expect it to win, win the race every time, you know, and, and that's kind of a fallacy in the way we don't we are kind of either ignore the whole rotation or the, the retirement part of it. Now, building security in, right, is, uh, 
it's, it's important because of this principle called mob, right? And for any crime or any cyber crime to be to, to happen, there has to be these three things that has to take place. There has to be some motive, there has to be an opportunity, right? And there has to be some means by which that's going to uh, manifest. Motive, hacker motivations have changed from being what I call the three C's of hacker motivation. It's changed from being the cool guy in the room, the whole ego factor, like, hey, look at me, I defaced this website, or I wrote the slam of worm. From the whole cool factor, it's moved over to the cash factor, which is the whole data is the name of the game, and you exploit data, and you, you, know, you can sell it in the market. Cyber crime as an economy is an excellent article by Harvard Business Review that you guys should be reading, which talks about why hackers do what they do, right? And there's a lot of, a lot of cash in that. But now we're also starting to see the whole cost factor, and the whole cost factor is hacktivism, right? They're doing something for a thing that they believe in. And that is something that you can't really mitigate by, by giving more money or just giving them fame, right? So it's the free badly managed, or you know, WikiLeaks, the freedom of speech. Uh, if you go after our hackers, like GeoHots with uh, Sony, then they'll get back at you. So Anonymous actually put out Opsony, which was, Opsony, which was uh, I'll go after you because you went after GeoHots, right? And so they have a cost that they're going, and that's actually a much more dangerous threat agent that we need to deal with. So we need to understand the worker <coughs> motivations. And then the whole aspect of building in the appropriate processes into the controls, as I showed in the previous slide, so it's integrated in the SDLC from requirements to release, and then eventually retirement as well, all right? Now, from a fun to the, the quality number two is that functionality actually maps to a security plan, all right? Which means that when I have to run a race, you don't focus on the amount of distance that you're going to race, but you're going to focus with what you're going to actually break the tape at the end of the run, race, right? So in terms of you keep beginning with the end in mind, is how secure is my software going to be? Is the approach we should be looking at. So, so you take functionality and then you tie that, tie that down to the controls in the security plan. Now, when I talk about the security plan, what is the security plan? It's going to be a framework. But how many of you have like, a security plan for your organization? Uh, truthfully. Right? Few of you have security plans, right? What, what does it actually give you? It gives you a foundation for some assurance, all right? Then help me, under, help me complete the statement. Failing to plan is equal to? All right, so 10 points to you. <laughs> right. so, so what does the security plan really give you? It gives you kind of an overview of applicable security requirements. And that's important because you don't want to have all security requirements. Unfortunately, in most organizations, what's happened is you have a blanket overarching umbrella security plan. And in many cases, it becomes very onerous for the development staff to be able to go implement that plan within the product that they built. And so looking and identifying what are your external requirements, right? So if you don't do credit card transactions, PCI DSS would not actually even apply. And that may be something that your auditors may say is part of a compliance checklist, which in your scope is out of scope. In your software is out of scope. So looking at the governance, the regulations, the compliance, the privacy requirements from an external standpoint, but also your internal policies and standards becomes important. Uh, the plan also should be calling out the controls that need to be in place, and controls both from a proactive standpoint in being safeguards that you need to build in, and reactive standpoint in terms of the countermeasures that need to be in place so that when you get attacked, you can react appropriately. Right? And the whole plan takes a very system, a, a people-centric approach, and then also an operation and a management of risk-based approach. And that's kind of what you should be looking back when you go back to your organization and see how comprehensive your security plan is. And so I could then map my functionality over to my security plan. And a map software would look something like this. So I have a security requirements from PCI DSS, which says remote test and default accounts before release, right? Now I could do that where I have to change and make sure that I have unique usernames and it's not the default that is installed as a control that is put in place, which goes and ties into the functionality itself of the software that each user must have a unique account when interacting with the system. Uh, you can go further down to say there are other threats that I identify which get with, which gets mitigated by having a, having put this control in place itself. And so our plan kind of becomes granular to some degree, but also it gives you the benefit of having tied to requirements that you can go back when auditors come in and knock your door, that we have these controls in place and they tie to, to, to these, these uh, you know, requirements that we need to comply with. So requirement number three, or quality number three, if you go and look and study any of the superstructures, what you would find is in proportion to the height of the building, there is a very deep foundation. And in some cases, the foundation is as deep as the, as, you know, as, deep as the, the structure that it has to, uh, to support. 
So what lies beneath becomes crucial. And so in highly secure software, some of the basic first things that need to be put first are these, 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 these concepts of what I call the CIA AAA, right? So you start with confidentiality, and confidentiality in terms of encryption or some mechanism that needs to be in place to assure that there is disclosure protection. When we look at integrity itself, we're looking at integrity from the standpoint of making sure that the system is going to protect itself against unauthorized modifications or that it's reliably functioning. So hashing would be a control example of uh, integrity. Input validation would be another control example of, you know, of integrity. Um, CRUD, uh, create, read, update, delete checks. Those would be other uh, control elements of integrity. Availability. It's about making sure that your system is available to the people that it ought to be available and not available to those people who are, that it not, ought not to be available. And so you may have to think about how you actually do your connection polling, how you actually you know, leave uh, connections open or not uh, from, a, from a security and a threat standpoint. Also the whole load balancing, the DR that needs to be in place. Uh, authentication. If your system is, highly, uh, had, is, is dealing with highly sensitive information, multi-factor authentication may be required. So you look, look at it from a, who you are, you know, to what you know and what you have, right? So multiple factors that you have to look into building into your software itself. At a bare minimum, these are some of the things that you need to have in place. Authorization, who can do what, right? And what rights and privileges do they have to have? So you may have to think about your software architected always with like role-based access control or mandatory access controls, discretionary access controls, depending on what your access control model is. In some cases, it may be a, a in some cases, it may be a, a resource-based access control, or in other cases, it may be a complete trusted subsystem with an impersonation and delegation. All that comes into place as you look at the overall authorization decisioning that you need to put into your software. And finally, the whole auditing aspect, which is detective. And in some cases, it can be deterrent if people know about you being audited. They may actually deter, be, be deterred from doing something. So who did what, when, and where, right? And when we do the, the in, in this morning's talk with the, at the keynote, Michael Howard talked about root cause analysis as a single word, right? And he talks about you need to get out, get out of the vicious cycle of like write code, you know, deploy, get hacked, then go back, write code, right? So we need to get, get past that to really fixing it with the root cause analysis. And the why is what we can actually try to glean from the auditing controls that we put into place, which will give you insight into the root cause analysis itself. So with, uh, with that, we're kind of about, you know, halfway through the quality. So this would be a point to leave. If I'm <laughs> um, so uh, quality number four is that the software itself is balanced. When we talk about balance, you know, the, um, how many of you have seen the movie Finding Nemo? Raise your hands. What are you guys doing watching kids' movies? <laughs> um, I've watched it so many times. Uh, what is interesting about Finding Nemo is the fact that uh, the people who did the movie, they went and scientifically studied the sharks. Uh, to see the patterns as to how they navigate, and they emulated like real-world shark behavior in the movie. So it is actually a movie that is scientifically correct. All right, so you guys have my approval to watch it from that standpoint. <laughs> uh, but the movie Jaws, the first poster of the movie Jaws, uh, you know, the, this lady swimming on top and this, this shark that's coming up, that was scientifically incorrect because a great white has triangular teeth, not pointed teeth. But the poster actually had the picture of a mako shark, which was posted as a great white shark. So that is scientifically incorrect, but it's still a good movie to watch. So you still have my approval for that. Right? And so, so in Finding Nemo, you hear about this whole symbiotic relationship right, between the clownfish and the sea anemone. Now, uh, because one is beneficial to the other, and the, the, both are actually beneficial to each other. The most software today we have is kind of parasitic where it's not really symbiotic, where it benefits the other. So when we talk about balancing, we look at it from a win-win standpoint. But what is it that we're really trying to balance? Right? So we're trying to, first and foremost, balance the risk against the reward, which kind of goes into this whole lingo that I mentioned about ROI. Right? What's, what is the risk of this software being breached, or the reward if I put the controls into it in, in appropriate uh, you know, um, implementations? Uh, the functionality with the, with the assurance aspect itself. Uh, unfortunately, we are governed by what is called the Iron Triangle. So how many of you work for an organization that gives you unlimited time to build your software? All right, no, okay, so time is an issue. Um, unlimited budget. Damn, I'm, I'm looking for a prospective employer. <laughs> so, so resources is an issue, right? So we have time. But then how many of you face the situation where you have the software being defined at one point and then you come back to the point and they, when the, 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 there's like a scope creep thing where by the time you build the software, it's not really anymore what was originally accepted on. 
you guys are all liars. Oh, there's Dario. Dario is the one, the only check. Yeah. So we all face this. The scope is expanding, time and uh, and resources are fixed. So you are always are going to have an isosceles or a skewed triangle. You're never going to have, you know, an equilateral triangle. And so this whole iron triangle that we have to deal with. And um, you know, Dicky, uh, the technical director for NSA, was asked this question, right? How are we doing in this race? Of functionality versus uh, security, and he kind of talks about it in this in this article called the balancing act. And this is what he was asked: So, are we actually winning? And do you think what is what is his response? He says it's a race and it's a real trade trade off. The one thing that I can say is that we're really not you know winning, but you need to put in the appropriate opportunities so you can take into account and build the additional security that needs to be in place. So we have to balance this out. Now, in addition to balancing risk reward, functionality, and assurance, we also need to balance our threats with our control, right? So this probably will be the takeaway for the techie crowd over here, right? Is to see is what are some of the things. Oh, this is not a comprehensive list, but of a, you know of the historically prevalent overflow attacks. Making sure that you have string length checks and you have bounce bounce checking, so that the, always the, the length of your input is going to be less than the byte size of what the memory or the buffer can actually handle, right? So you don't fall prey to overflow attacks. Or using band uh, deprecating band APIs and using safe APIs. Injection flaws. How many of you have heard, or heard about SQL injection, or command injection, or XPath injection, LDAP injection, just the whole injection flaw, flaw? What happens in an injection flaw? Why is it even possible for an attack to take place from, and it's so prevalent today? What's, what's the underlying root cause of an injection flaw? Okay, poor input validation, but. Right, so data becomes executed as command, right? So input validation to mitigate it to a degree, but then the appropriate controls will be making sure that you have what's parameterized queries or prepared statements, show procedures that actually don't take that data and then interpret it as a command that the backend interpreter is going to execute. You know? So we look at validating input as one thing, parameterized queries, cross-site scripting, attack against the client. Right? So in this case, rather than actually depending more on the input validation side, which is important, so you can do request validates, making sure that you know it doesn't take in the script tags and things like that, it's more important that we encode the output, so output handling and encoding becomes crucial. Um, Cross-site request forgery, right? Classic attack, in fact, interestingly, there's not much data that's collected on it because it's, it's close undetected in most cases, and with the whole request being forged, you can't make a differentiation between a legitimate request and a, and a fraud request. And so in this case, you have to, be, we have to go back to making sure that our user authenticated tokens are specific to that session. In some cases, it maybe have to tie, be tied to the hardware itself, some hardware property. So you can essentially make sure that it is no longer, you know, um, it's not something that can be replayed and, and forged. Denial of service, load balancing, replication, whether it's active, 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 passive, you've got to be looking at. Repudiation, it's interesting. I kind of actually put code signing here. And then in the social engineering, social engineering talk, uh, uh, Relic, uh, Dave Kennedy, he basically said that uh, um, statistically it's actually insignificant of what he has found out in his research, uh, the number of people who accept signed code or unsigned code. When that, when, that, when that certificate or the prompt is prompted to you, do you trust me? Most of us don't even read it and we say what? Oh. Yes, right? So, yeah, <laughs> most of us I said. <laughs> So, so you know, it's important from that standpoint. And then another big thing is in terms of the in terms of the, the reversing itself, right? Making sure that you have is the is the bugger API address and inside like opaque predicates and things like that that actually can look at the system itself of obfuscation of the, the code. So when you deploy it, you have also have controls in place so it can't be reversed. Now quality number five is incorporating those secure requirements we talked into. And that means making sure that we don't lose the requirements in translation. So how many of you have heard this? So send reinforcements, we're going to advance, right? This is a military strategist, uh, you know, getting this command to say, you know, we're going to advance, so we need more reinforcements. And in lost, lost in translation, we change that to send three and four pens, we're going for a dance, right? And that's what's happening most of the times with regard to security itself. As we go from the functionality to security, it really doesn't factor into what the original requirement itself was and kind of gets diluted. So it's very crucial now in terms of us making sure that the requirements are put into place that we first seek to understand and then to be understood from a security standpoint. We need to understand who. The, the one big player in our thing is, is the business itself, making sure that we understand the requirements from the external aspects as to what are some of those requirements. So from regulations, you, know, you can talk about SOX, HIPAA, uh, your VA, FISMA, whichever is your poison, right? And then you would look into the industry standards of ISO, NIST, PCI, OSS, and other standards that you need to have in place. Um, 
privacy with COPA, and then on the internal side, you've got company governance and business functionality. So some of the things that we can look at is, is the whole, from a methodology standpoint, data classification to understand what those requirements are as to how, what controls you need to put into place, the appropriate levels of controls that you need to put in, subject and object matrix, right? So you have those relationships in terms of role-based controls. And then the use and abuse case, which is part of the whole requirements, which takes not just a use case approach to security, but kind of an abuse case as well, or a misuse case uh, to look into it. And that kind of can give you a lot of security requirements that you can take back and build into the code itself. Um, quality number six, is it, uh, is it collaboratively developed, which essentially is that there is no I in team. In other words, that would be to synergize, right? Now, the synergy itself comes from where? It actually just doesn't come from the development organization itself. The software is a component of your IT function, and there are a lot of other players involved in this. So the stakeholders that are part of this are going to be your business, your critical you know, business unit itself that you're supporting or building the software for. It could be internal or external, a customer, a client, a security team itself. We need to take into the folks who get stand in our way, the management. <laughs> no, but we got to get to understand, just translate those requirements to those folks that understand it in the language of risk, and see how we can actually still build highly secure software. The development team, um, as much as you may not want to involve your lawyers, uh, you know it's important, especially if you have to if you're building software that you're publishing, then the legalese that becomes right. Uh, one of the things that I always read when I'm Installing software is, is there a clause in there which says you shall not reverse engineer, decompile, decode, you know? And many software, if you notice, which is actually done by short, small shops, don't actually put that clause in there, which, which means what? Anything that we do to look into the software, they have no legal precedence to be able to do so. So getting involvement from your legal teams is important, especially if you're building like multicultural international software, then having to factor in those international requirements becomes crucial as well. Uh, privacy is another big player, and uh, this morning we heard that you know you can have um, uh, you can have uh, security and privacy interplay that uh, Michael Howard was talking about, and I think if I'm not mistaken, he said you can have uh, privacy without security, but you can't have security without privacy, right? So it's important for us to recognize that as well. You know where I'm going. You can't like jump out. You can't stay in the plane. <laughs> no auditors are good. Actually, leverage them to your advantage. You know why? Because management listens to what auditors tell. Right? So if you want to actually include security and get resources, become friends with your auditors and tell them what they need to put into the report. <laughs> right? I need this much money, I need this, you know, this many resources to build this highly secure software. And when they say it, management will listen. Right? So leverage them and add to your system. And then vendors, when it comes to the whole supply chain of security, making sure to give the communicator requirements to them effectively so they can actually um, build it in. Um, so I always say, if you don't communicate your security requirements to your vendors, you're not going to get it in the software that they produce. If you communicate your security requirements to your vendors, you're not going to get the security <laughs> no, you know, At least you have some hope that you have some liability and coverage in the whole supply chain security itself. Right? And then finally, that the software itself is adaptable. So uh, how many of you know what uh, polyfiodont means? So I can pretty much make up anything, and you guys are going to trust me, right? So, so poly on Poly, what's the word poly? Many. Many. Dontics? T. So the shark is actually a poly on which means it has many rows of teeth. And what we call, you know, it's actually modified placard scales that come from within the underneath of the jaw. And as each layer of teeth, as each row of teeth goes away, the other row kind of replaces it. So when I talk about uh, software itself, I'm talking about sharpening the saw or making sure that the software is resilient over time because threat factors, talent pools, and, uh, and you know, the technology itself changes. So MD5, which was an insecure, or what was deemed to be a secure algorithm 10 years ago, is no longer secure now because of the collisions that we see in the, in the algorithm itself for hashing. So, so technology has changed. The threat attack vectors are changing, right? So we're not just looking at the, the script kiddies. We're looking at organized criminals to you know, cyber defense and, in many cases, you know, activists and folks that we don't even know who they are, the anonymous and the lull sex and so on and so forth. And talent is also changing. Now, earlier it was about talent pool that was coming and migrating from one location to the other. Now work itself is going to other locations. And so we have to look at the overall talent pool to see if they end up actually creating software that, that will not be resilient over time or which will not be adaptable. So like cryptographic agility and things like that we need to take into account as we build software that is quickly adaptable to the changing times. So essentially it means begin with the future in mind. 
Now, I'll be on my soapbox for a minute, and the reason I'm, I'm going to do that is I believe that if we put things in place to have highly secure software built over time, not only will we be, be proactive about security, we can truly get to be predictive about security. Now, if any of you want to take me up on that challenge, then over 10 years from now, let's you know meet again and, and talk about seeing if we can. And I think security will become so crucial, like chain management and other things, that it needs to be integrated into the process. So we really become predictive to the best of our ability about security itself. So more information, you know, there's going to be a book signing. Uh, I said this now, it's not uh, pimping my book, but if you need more information, then buy my book. <laughs> so if you like this presentation, you know, or you do not like this presentation, you need other presentations for your company, or you have security program development, or consulting training, awareness needs, or security certification needs, then you can contact me. Else, you know, have a great day the rest of the day. And finally, thank you, and go build highly secure software. The ways that you can actually contact me is like through LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, that's my Twitter account, I've got my email there. And if you see that, then that's my, you know, my signature. So if, you know, in Twitter and other things, if you see that, then that's me. And Manu actually in Hawaii means shark, by the way. So I, thank you very much, and I'm open for questions.